D-Day, with the fate of the war hanging in the balance. Half a million troops, backed by millions more, faced outward across the stormy sea. On beaches that dotted the French coast of the Channel, British, Canadian and American troops touched shore. The first fateful moment passed, and Allied troops were holding on French soil. One week after the landings, the commander was able to say to the vast armies under him, your accomplishments in the last seven days of this campaign have exceeded my highest hopes. Less than two months after the invasion, the Allied force broke out of the beachhead perimeter in the hedgerow country around St. Lo. of the breakout was the next step. And now there began the dramatic pursuit, spearheaded by General George S. Patton's armored force across the heart of France. And then the grand triumphant march through Paris, which was freed by French troops and soldiers of the U.S. Fifth Corps. Beyond Paris lay the liberation of Belgium and the yard-by-yard -yard struggle across the German border. Blocking the steady pursuit of victory lay the Nazi counter-offensive in the Ardennes sector, known as the Battle of the Bulge. Through a grim and bleak period of several weeks, the enemy, supported by the most devastating of weather conditions, isolated and assaulted Allied forces. General Eisenhower called upon all troops to rise to new heights of courage and effort. The brave men of the beleaguered forces held and steadily began pressing the enemy back. And from that moment onward, the supreme commander counted on weakened Nazi resistance. The bridge at Remagen across the Rhine, one of the sturdiest symbols of the war. With its crossing in March 1945, the heart of the enemy's defenses was cracked. There remained the substantial task of mopping up what was left of the enemy west of the Rhine. And accepting his surrender in the droves that began to appear. The great cities of the enemy's fatherland were rubble as Allied troops moved through them in the last stages of the enemy's defeat. Both Commander and G.I. were able to find the exaltation that comes when victory is close. Victory came finally with the German surrender in a schoolhouse at Reims on May the 7th, 1945. The return to peace was signaled by the Supreme Commander. I have the proud privilege of speaking for a victorious army of almost five million fighting men. They, and the women who have so ably assisted them, constitute the Allied Expeditionary Forces that have liberated Western Europe. They have captured or destroyed enemy armies totaling more than their own strength. Merely to name my principal subordinates in the Canadian, 
French, American, and British forces is to present a picture of the utmost in efficiency, skill, loyalty, and devotion to duty. The United Nations will gratefully remember Tedder, Montgomery, Spots, Bradley, Delat, Creer, and many others. But all these agree with me in the selection of the truly heroic figure of this war. He is G.I. Joe and his counterpart in the Air, the Navy, and the Merchant Marine of every one of the United Nations. He has braved the dangers of U-boat infested seas. He has surmounted charges into desperately defended beaches. He has fought his tedious, patient way through the ultimate in fortified zones. He has endured cold, hunger, fatigue, his companion has been danger. Death has dogged his footsteps. He and his platoon commanders have given us an example of loyalty, devotion to duty, and indomitable courage that will live in our hearts as long as we admire those qualities in men. And now, the long and happy road home. For Dwight Eisenhower, that road was paved with the cheers of the people of the Allied countries. In his own homeland, a hero's welcome awaited him. America's greeting for a favorite son. Here, the story of Dwight D. Eisenhower might well have ended, on this note of triumphant acclaim for a job so splendidly done. But America had other tasks waiting for its favorite soldier. Eisenhower succeeded General Marshall as the Army's first post-war chief of staff. He expressed the belief that one of the greatest pillars of world peace is a strong United States. He visited troops stationed in various parts of the world to show America's growing sense of global responsibility. We must remain, he said, the first champions of those who seek to lead their own lives in peace with their neighbors. Finally, on February the 7th, 1948, the general from Abilene, after 36 years of service to his country, left active military assignment. But not active participation in the life of his nation. He accepted an invitation from Columbia University to serve as president of that great institution, enabling him, so he thought at the time, to devote the remainder of his useful life to the challenges of education. But events of the post-war world dictated otherwise. The urgent necessity for unity in the free world brought into being the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And it was evident that only one man could make that vital and complicated organization work from the outset, Dwight D. Eisenhower. At the end of 1950, he answered his country's call once more. And once more, he was on European soil to assume supreme command of the land, the sea, and the air forces of a grand defensive alliance. Against the new threat rising from the Soviets, who had once been his nation's ally, he had to create in the war-weary European soul the will to defend itself, so that freedom so dearly bought would not be lost. For more than a year, he labored diligently at his task of coalition. When he turned over the reins of command to General Matthew Ridgway, the structure of military unity among free nations, on which rested the hope for continued peace, was established. Once again, with the accomplishment of substantial victory behind him, this might well have been the end of his public career, and in a sense it was, the closing chapter in the story of Eisenhower the soldier. History is recording today the story of Eisenhower, the statesman. The stories may be separate, but soldier and statesman, they are the same man, Dwight D. Eisenhower, citizen of the United States, spokesman for and symbol of the free world.
and son of Abilene. As rich a study as this nation has produced of the capacity for greatness which lies at its grassroots. The big picture is an official report for the armed forces and the American people. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the Department of the Army in cooperation with this station.